owe you an apology. And I, I want to go ahead and, and just give that apology. I told you in the summer that we would finish Romans before the snow flies. I totally, it was an honest mistake. I forgot where I live. But what I meant was, we will finish Romans before the snow sticks. That's what I meant. So, um, yeah, here we are. We're going to finish what we started uh, on June the 26th, 2016. And that is a verse-by-verse expositional study of a Paul's missionary fundraising letter to the Romans. I do want to praise God for you guys and your appetite for Scripture. You remind me of the Bereans. Paul said in Acts 17, the Bereans were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. The Bereans received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Not every church is as noble-minded as the Bereans, but you are. And it brings me great joy. In 1674, an Anglican priest named Thomas Ken wrote a simple song of praise for his students at Winchester College in England. He told his students, sing it in private, sing it in secret, because it was frowned upon to see people sing words other than Scripture. The words that he penned go like this. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have you heard those lyrics before? Raise your hand if you have. What was once sung in secret has become one of the most frequently sung hymns in all the world. It's called what? The doxology. Doxology is a praise saying or a glory saying. The Bible is full of doxologies. There are two in Romans, one at the end of chapter 11, one at the end of the letter. And I do want to point out before we read the text that I think it is significant that Paul's doxologies followed his theology. There's a, a, an author and pastor named Matt Boswell. He's a church planter down in Texas. He wrote a book, Doxology and Theology. Listen to what he says. Theology shapes doxology. Christian worship is built upon, shaped by, and saturated with Scripture. He said, doxology without theology is an impossibility. If we know nothing of God, His greatness, His holiness, His goodness, His gospel, we would have no reason to worship Him. And so I say, church family, we have studied the theology of Romans. We have great reason for doxology. Amen. Look at 1625. We'll put this on the screen. And uh, I'll, I'll read the independent phrases in 25 and then we'll read our text 27. Now to him who is able to establish you. According to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Here's our text. To the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. I want to introduce you to four men. The first, we'll put his picture up, is John Willison Green. Uh, this picture was taken in 1973. You guys have a picture of him? Yeah. John Willison Green. In 1957, 
Green began to dedicate his life to a single purpose. For 60 years, until he died at 89 years old, he had one passion for his life. I want to show you a picture of Rene de Hinden. De Hinden began to pursue a single passion and purpose when he was in his 20s. And so for 50 years, until he was 70 years old, he had one passion, one purpose. I want to show you another guy. This is an anthropologist named Grover Krantz. Krantz was a researcher who dedicated his life to one passion. In 1963, he died in 2002 at the age of 70. He had never turned from his passion. This next guy, Peter C. Byrne, began to burn with passion in 1947. This picture was taken in 1957 when he was 32 years old. He's still alive. Here's a picture of him more recently. He has spent the last, get this, 73 years pursuing one passion, one purpose. Ironically, all four of these men lived and burn still lives his life for the same passion. These four men are known as the four horsemen of the Sasquatchery. These four men live their lives looking for Bigfoot. It's the passion of their lives. I want to talk to you this morning. As we finish Romans about a single passion, a single purpose that leaves no regrets. No regrets. Doxa in doxology comes from the word dokeo, which means to seem. It literally means opinion. What do, th- what, what do things seem to you? What's your opinion? However, listen to what the theological dictionary of the New Testament says about doxa. While the term doxa can denote reputation or power, its main use in the New Testament is shaped by the Old Testament. Thus, it becomes a biblical term rather than a Greek term. You see, the Greek word doxa is used to translate the Hebrew word Glory. The Hebrew word that's translated glory. Now listen to this. The theological dictionary of the New Testament says, While individual nuances may embrace divine honor, splendor, power, or radiance, what is always expressed with doxa is the divine mode of being. I taught you a word when we started Romans. Ontology. Do you remember ontological corruption? That's how we define depravity. Ontology is the study of being. Listen, you can't talk about the ontology of man without the word depravity. Because, that, because sin impacted our being. Now hear me, church. You cannot talk about the ontology of God, the being of God, without the word glory. And that's what this theological dictionary is trying to say. Glory gets at the heart of the being of God. Now listen to what the theological dictionary of the New Testament says. In the New Testament, giving God glory means acknowledging or extolling what is already a reality. Now that's big. And hear me out on this. It's not like we have something God needs. This is important. Psalm 50 verse 12, God says, If I was hungry, I would not tell you. He says, 
The world is mine and all it contains. Guys, I want you to write this down. I want to start right here. God does not need us or need to save us to be glorious. God is glorious. You see that? It's not like God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were sitting around one day in need. Saying, man, if we could just make some humans, then they could give us what we need. They could give us glory. That, that's not the way it went down. There's a lot of false gospels that operate under that very man-centered theology. And that's not the true gospel. Listen to what Paul said in Acts 17. He said, the God who made the world does not dwell in temples made with hands. He said this, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Now, and so, so that's our basis right there. God is glorious. So what does it mean to say to God be the glory? Isn't that a very important question? Especially since... At the end of Romans 11, the doxology there says that we were created for His glory. That we were redeemed. Those of you who are born again, you were redeemed for His glory. We need to know what does that mean, right? To God be the glory. We say it. I say it all the time. A follow-up question. Why does Paul say God, to God be the glory through Jesus Christ? Or in 25, according to the preaching of Christ. And then i got two more questions. Why does Paul highlight the wisdom of God right here? When there were so many other attributes of God to highlight. The only wise God. Why did he do that? And then probably the most important question would be this. How does this impact us this week? Now, the first question is the most difficult, I think. The glory, what is the glory of God? Let's just start there. This is not like the word dog. You can define dog, right? Well, a dog is a four, furry, four-legged, domesticated carnivore of the family Canidae. Canidae. It's part of the wolf-like canide. Uh, it's the most widely abundant terrestrial carnivore. I just define dog, no problem. How do you define glory? I, I think glory is one of those nouns that needs an object. The glory of God, right? It's kind of like the word beauty. Beauty needs an object, right? The beauty of Brandy Miller. Yeah! So, so let's, let's just do this. So if Paul mentioned in verse 26, the Old Testament Scriptures... If the theological dictionary of the New Testament says glory comes out of the Old Testament scriptures, let's begin there. Write this down. The Hebrew word for glory means heavy, kabod, weighty. Now, Miss Amanda, um, and, and she and I didn't talk about this. This is God, but she already read or mentioned Isaiah 6. Can you guys put Isaiah 6? Yeah. What do the angels cry? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then watch this. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now this is a very important clue as we search what is the glory of God. I would have thought the angels would say, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his holiness. But, but they didn't. So that tells me the glory of God is a consequence of His holiness. I mean, the angels did not cry out, Love, love, love. The whole earth is full of His glory. Kind, kind, kind. The whole earth is full of His glory. That's not what they said. They said, Holy, holy, holy. That means holiest. Write this down. The Hebrew word kadosh, holy, means set apart. Set apart. 
Now, Paul said in verse 26 that all, all of this that he's talking about is according to the Scriptures. Let me take you to Exodus 28. We'll put this on the screen. This is um, Moses interacting with God on Mount Sinai, receiving the Mosaic Covenant. He comes back, he shares it with the people. Listen to Exodus 28, 1. God says, Then bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to minister to me as priests to me. Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Now look at verse 2. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, Watch this. For glory and for beauty. You see that? This is a clue. Verse 3. You shall speak to all the skillful persons whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom that they, may, that they make Aaron's garments. Watch this. To consecrate him. That's the word kadosh. Holy. To make him holy. Set him apart. That he may minister as a priest to me. Now I'm going to read you something. That, that, that we studied years ago in Nehemiah. The holy garments of the Old Testament priests. Served as reminders of the glory and the beauty of the Lord. God clothed the priest with these garments. That would reflect the beauty of his holiness. When David was taking the ark back to Jerusalem, he wrote a song. Listen to it. First Chronicles 16, we'll put it on the wall. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come to Him. Watch this. Worship the Lord in holy array. The word array, it's the Hebrew word beauty. So we're going to ascribe to Him His glory, the glory due Him... Through worshiping him in this holy beauty. The splendor of his holiness. Now, some of you are already theologians. And your mind has raced ahead. And you've already got where I'm trying to get. And you're already thinking... Oh, wow. Oh, wow. We're the priesthood of the believers. Oh, wow. We're wearing garments. I know what we're wearing. And some of you guys are like, no, I need you to just kind of keep going. So let me just keep going. Let me just keep going. So let's just, def let's try. I know, I know we can't do this justice. Let me try to define the glory of God. I mean, that's crazy to try. But let me try. The glory of God is the infinite beauty and the greatness of God's holy perfection. Now there's no way... That does justice to the glory of God. But it, I think it comes close to getting us in the right direction because it's biblical. I mean, I got this out of Scripture. It's the infinite beauty and the greatness of God's holy perfection. Now, where did Romans begin? Do you remember? Romans began showing us the consequence of Adam's sin and our sin. In relation to God's glory. And in Romans 3.22. It says there is no distinction. Meaning 3.23 applies to Jews and Gentiles. Do you know what 3.23 says? All have sinned and fallen short of what? The glory of God. The glory of God. We fall short is this Greek word to lack. We lack the glory of God. We cannot behold the infinite beauty and greatness of God's holy perfection. Why? Because sin has left us unwilling and unable to stand before and enjoy the splendor of God's holiness. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. That's why. Romans 6.23. Now, Aaron was the first high priest. That's Moses' brother. 
And all the high priests came, all the priests came of Aaron's line. Aaron and Moses were of the tribe of Levi. It's called the Aaronic priesthood. Now, Aaron, being the high priest, was the only one that could go behind the veil in the temple into the Holy of Holies. Now, look at Leviticus 10. And I'll put this on the screen. It says, Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, Aaron's sons, they're not the high priest, Aaron's the high priest took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on on it and offered strange fire before the Lord which he had not commanded them. Now look at verse 2. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Yeah, that's kind of obvious, right? They died. (laughs) Verse 3. Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke. Saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as what? Holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. Guess what the word honored is in Hebrew? It's the word kabod, glorified. And so Aaron kept silent. Now, did you catch it? It's not just the, 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 the fire came out from the presence of the Lord and killed them. The Hebrew word for consumed is the word to eat. The wrath of God ate, it consumed them. Man, I, I'm thinking back to Hebrews 12, 29 that says, Our God is A consuming fire. I had trouble striking this. Our God is a... Can can y'all see that? Can you see that fire? I mean, that's just a little tiny propane torch. Our God is a consuming fire. In the Old Testament law, God gave His people these instructions regarding their sin. And He gave a way to atone. To cover their guilt. Now look at, uh, I'll put this on the wall. Numbers 28. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses saying, This is the offering by fire which you shall offer to the Lord Two male lambs, one year old, without defect, as a continual burnt offering every day. You shall offer the one lamb in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And so guys, day after day, month after month, year after year, every morning, every evening, the Old Testament priests, priests, would sacrifice the burnt offering at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. 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 That's a lot of blood. And all this blood and all this death was to make atonement. To make a covering for sin. But what? It was never enough. Why? Because we got to do it again tomorrow at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. And these animal sacrifices are inadequate to extinguish God's holy wrath. Now, in uh, Leviticus 9, God told Aaron... Said, hey, make atonement. I want to talk to you guys. In 9.22 of Leviticus, we put this up. Aaron lifted his hands. He blessed the people. He stepped down and he made the sin offering and the burn offering and the peace offering. Then he and Moses went into the tent of meeting. When they came out, the Bible says, The glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Now watch this. Verse 24. Fire came out. From before the Lord and what? Consumed the burnt offering. 
Now you guys remember when Elijah confronted Ahab and said, You know what? Let's get all your prophets of Baal and let's meet on Mount Carmel. And they did. And, and Elijah said, Okay, build your altar, put your wood on it, put your animal on it. And you call out to Baal and let Baal bring the fire. Remember that? I think it's 1 Kings 18. And so they, they built their altar and they put the wood on, they put their animal on, and they began to call out to Baal, but what happened? Nothing. And so the Bible says they got up, they jumped up on the altar, and they began to scream, and they took swords, and they slashed themselves, and their blood went down on the altar, and they screamed to Baal. To bring fire. What happened? Nothing. And so then Elijah comes and he's got the he's built the stone altar and he's he's got the stones there and he's got the wood and he's got the animal. And the Bible says in 1 Kings 18 36 that this was at the time, don't miss this, of the evening sacrifice. What time is that? 3 p.m. And it says here that he called out to God in verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed. Are we seeing a theme here? Consumed the burnt offering. And the wood. And the stones. And the dust. And licked up the water. Remember he put like 12 pitchers of water on it. In the trench. And when the people saw it. They said oh that's pretty cool. No. They fell on their faces. And they said the Lord he is God. Here's what I thought. I thought, you know what? Just as an illustration, before I finish the sermon, I'm going to burn this rock up. I'm going I'm to take this torch and I'm going to consume this rock just to give you some feel for what that was like to see that. So give me just a minute. When I finish this, I'll get back to the sermon. Gosh, this might take a minute. Are you, are you catching the drift? Now let me try to connect all these dots. Romans 1.16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. You guys have any idea what we need to be saved from? The wrath of God. The consuming... Wrath of our perfectly, infinitely holy God. None of those sacrificial lambs could do it. But there came a sacrifice, not a a lamb at nine and three, but there was this once and for all lamb of God who was crucified at what time? 9 a.m. Who said, it is finished at what time? 3 p.m. That once and for all extinguished the wrath of God. For all who repent and believe. Now, how do I know it was was extinguished? Well, here's one clue. Was his body still hanging on the cross or had it been totally consumed? Still hanging there. Put in a borrowed tomb, risen, appeared to those witnesses God chose, ascended, and coming again. Jesus was sufficient. He was God. He was man. He was the God-man. And this is why Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, 
we have peace with God. And he says this. We exult, Romans 5, 2. We exult in hope of the glory of God. Miss Pat Dent, who passed away at 1 a.m., is now beholding what we only see glimpses of, the glory of God. And so I think now we've answered the first two questions. To say to Him be the glory through Christ means, write this down, my entire life and eternity is beholding God. With this indestructible peace through the person and work of Christ. Because remember verse 25? Paul said, to him who is able to establish. To make you stand firm. There's no fire left for me. It's all been put on Christ. Now, let me try to... Very quickly, answer these other two questions. First of all, why the only wise God? Well, what's wisdom? Wisdom is knowing the greatest goal in any situation. And the best way to achieve it. In God's wisdom, He brought about our salvation, not just in any way, but in the best way. That best magnifies His glory. Reveals His glory. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 1, 22, The Jews ask for signs. The Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block. To the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called... Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. And he says this, But by his doing you are in Christ, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So I I wrote this down. God has made his glory Available to us by faith alone, in His grace alone. Stripping us of any opportunity to boast in ourselves. Leaving us boasting only in Him. And I'll say this. Every part of my testimony and your testimony is, reveals the manifold wisdom of God for His glory. I, I was talking to Brandy yesterday about our oldest child, Laura, and... Many of you, you know, kind of watched us raise her. She was going in the ninth grade when we moved here. And um, I'd baptized her twice. Once when she was like four. Again when she was like ten. Because she couldn't remember her profession of faith. Man, when she got in about 11th, 12th grade, we, you know, I mean, what had concerned us with yellow flags became red flags. And we thought, gosh, is this girl converted And Brandy and I, you know, our heart is to make disciples. And the first place we, we do work on that is at home. And we pour our lives into those five kids. And man, when she graduated from high school in a bad place in her life, us not even thinking maybe she's not even saved Man, it was a hard time for us. And a lot of you guys watched us walk through that. I mean, it was bad. And then, a month or so after she graduated from high school, God saved her. And she was at a mission camp, and she came home, and for like four weeks she was home, and then she went off to college, and... She's pretty much been gone. 
And it's hard for me to describe all the emotions that go with this because we poured our lives into that, you know. And we're so glad she's saved. But I don't know if I want to call it I was mad or sad or what I was, but it was just like, God, why did we just get four weeks? And I know I shouldn't think like that, but Brandy said, you know, I get it. It was like she got saved, and then all that glory just left and went to Kansas City. And I told Brandy, I said, that's my point. It was never our glory. And, and we, we haven't really changed our strategy of what we do as parents to raise up our kids to love Jesus. But here's what we've been stripped of. We've been stripped of any opportunity to boast in our parenting our, our anything. It's God. It's God's glory. And in His manifold wisdom, salvation comes it's in such a manner that it maximizes the glory of God. Man, I've got so much more I want to read and say and talk to you about. When, when, uh, let, let me just say this. No matter what happens in my life, every good thing and every hard thing, God ordained it to show the weight of His beauty and His glory and His holiness. Everything. Sarah Beth was riding her bike when we went camping a couple of weeks ago down at, Red, uh, at uh, uh, Rathbun State Park. And, and I looked at her and her red hair was blowing and the breeze and the sun was shining and and as she rode by on her bike in the campground I said this Jesus you are so beautiful C.S. Lewis wrote an essay it's called Meditations in a Tool Shed I don't really have time to read this but I really need you to hear this he says, I was standing today in the dark tool shed. The sun was shining outside and through the crack at the top of the door there came a sunbeam. From where I stood, that beam of light with the specks of dust floating in it was the most striking thing in the place. Everything else was almost pitch black. I was seeing the beam... Not seeing things by it. He's in a dark tool shed. It's, he can't see anything, but he can see the beam. Then I moved. So that the beam fell on my eyes. Instantly, the whole previous picture vanished. I saw no tool shed and... Above all, no beam. Instead, I saw, framed in the irregular cranny at the top of the door, green leaves. Moving on the branches of a tree outside. And beyond that, 90 odd million miles away, the sun. Looking along the beam and looking at the beam are very different experiences. John Piper, commenting on that essay, says, The sunbeams of blessings in our lives are bright in and of themselves. They also give light to the ground where we walk. But there is a higher purpose for these blessings. God means for us to do more than stand outside them and admire them for what they are. Even more, He means for us to walk in them. And see the sun from which they come. If the beams are beautiful, the sun is even more beautiful. God's aim is not that we merely admire His gifts, but even more, His glory. Now, as I close, let me give you three ways that we do this. That we walk in that beam Number one, we repent and believe in the gospel for salvation. Friend, if you die without Christ, if you die never surrendering by faith alone to follow Jesus, 
you will waste your life and you will go to hell. And you will squander the only opportunity to behold and be conformed to the beauty and the splendor of God's holiness. And this happened for me in 1982 in Douglasville, Georgia. Community Grove Baptist Church. I repented and I believed in the gospel. And I got back what I lost in the Garden of Eden. And that's the glory of God. Number two, we continue to repent and believe. The gospel, we continue to repent and believe the gospel producing the obedience of faith. Abraham lived this. It says Romans 4.20 Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Last Tuesday, I try to take Tuesdays off. Last Tuesday, I had a trailer load of trash to haul to the, to the dump. I got to the dump. I'm throwing off my trash. And I find, I, for, I had forgotten it was on there, but I, I, I had a flat screen TV that we accidentally broke. And, it, and I had this thought, you know, I'm supposed to put this in the building and I'm supposed to pay to dump it. Isn't that crazy? You got to pay to throw away a TV. And I'm thinking, gosh, I don't want to pay to throw away a TV. But I did. I took it down to the building. I dumped all my used oil out. And I went back up to weigh out. And I'm pulling up on the scales. And I'm at a defining moment in my life. Am I going to tell her about that TV? I do not want to pay to throw away a TV. And so I said, uh, ma'am, I had an old flat screen TV on there. And she said, oh, that's another $12. And I'm thinking, good grief, $12. Now don't don't repeat this because it might get her in trouble. She said, but don't worry about it. Now, I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. What I'm telling you is, had I paid $12, I was okay with that because Jesus is better than saving $12 at the dump. And every day I get out of bed, I believe I am wearing the righteousness of Christ. And that impacts what I do and how I live. I don't live perfectly by any means. I'm a sinner, but I want God. I want to follow Jesus. And so I got back in the truck, had a nice conversation with the lady, got back in the truck. Radio was playing. Guess what the song was? He made us flawless. Mercy me. We continue to repent and believe the gospel producing the obedience of faith and number three we live our lives with this passion and this purpose to make the gospel known to others so they can behold and be conformed to this beauty of his holy perfection listen to what paul said in acts 20 24 I do not consider my life of any account dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. He said in Philippians 3, he suffered the loss of all things and he counts them as rubbish. Waste that he might gain Christ. Steve Feltham found the passion of his life in 1970. He was seven years old. In 1991, he quit his job, sold everything, and went to pursue the passion of his life full time. Here's his picture. He moved to Lake Loch Ness. 
where he spends his days looking for the Loch Ness Monster. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records. Longest running pursuit and hunt for Nessie. I remember when Laura was going to um, Indonesia to live four months in the largest Muslim country in the world. And she was getting on the plane and Eric Odegaard, who's been here recently, preached a few months ago, looked her in the eyes. He's the director of Fusion at Spurgeon. He looked her in the eyes and he said these two words. No regrets. No regrets. And I don't think any of you are looking for Bigfoot, to my knowledge. Or Nessie. But I would ask you right now as Brother Josh begins to play. What is the one passion, the one purpose for your life? Man, I'm going to tell you what I want to do. I want to get in the sunbeam. And I want to see everything through the lens of the glory of God. So me and my family, we took a wood burner and we burned the number one in 300 and some odd little uh, wood slices. And so we're going to close the service and we're going to end the book of Romans this way. Our praise team is going to sing. You know, God's wisdom put a plan together that says every day we need to go on believing. And the plan of salvation maximizes our chance to see His glory, His provision, His holiness. I want to live in that beam. And I want to leverage every good thing and every hard thing to magnify His beauty, His holiness, and His provision to give that to me. My one defense... His righteousness. So, as we close, maybe you want to come and kneel and repent for what you made your one thing. Maybe you want to just reaffirm your one thing. But I ask God that we would be a people with a single passion for a single purpose. When we stand before the Lord, we don't regret what we did with our little dash of time there's four tables you can come you can pick one up if you feel led to make this commitment and affirm this life calling you can write you can take a sharpie and you can write 1627 Romans 1627 you can write your favorite verse whatever it is you can write today's date there's strings on some of the tables still if you want to hang it on your in your room in your car around your neck I'll get you some more string. We might run out. But this is a token reminder of what not only Romans is about, but what everything is about. The glory of God.